morning, church family. Great to see your smiling faces in the room, and welcome to those of you that have joined us online today. We are wrapping up our sermon series, Mind Games, today. Excited to get to that, but just, man, baptism kind of got me in the mood of being in the water, and so I just want to take this opportunity just to encourage those of you who may have decided to follow Jesus at some point in your life, but you've never followed him in believer's baptism. It is your best next step, and we would love to help you uh, make that a reality here on a Sunday morning, if possible, but it doesn't have to be here. We can come to your house. We'll take it on the road. If you got a pool, we're there. We'll figure it out some way or another. In fact, I just want to remind you of something you've been hearing a lot about. My wife and I are leading a trip to the Holy Land in March, March 14th through the 23rd, and those that are on that trip are actually going to have an opportunity that would like to do this to be actually baptized in the Jordan River where Jesus himself was baptized. It's going to be an amazing opportunity. We're going to take a boat ride out onto the Sea of Galilee and, uh, and read some of the stories about what Jesus taught and what he did uh, there at the Sea of Galilee. We're obviously going to be uh, in the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, we'll be able to take off our shoes and get in bare feet and actually walk where Jesus walked. It's going to be a powerful time, and so I don't want you to miss out on it. Because of COVID, there's a lot of trips trying to go this next year, and so we've only reserved one bus We've got about 10 or 12 spots left on that bus, but you're invited to come and be a part of it. And we wanted you to know about it because it'll probably require like us to, to figure out how we're gonna do this uh, financially, um, but it's an all-inclusive deal. So three meals a day, all the gratuities for our tour guides and the buses and all that kind of stuff, hotels, airfare, everything is included in one price. And so if you want more information about that, you're invited to go to cedarcrestchurch.com slash holyland, and I hope that we will see you on the trip. Well, hey, as I think about wrapping up what we've been talking about uh, when it comes to mind games, we've, we've discussed some really big ideas, and we're blowing through a massive topic in the span of five weeks, but really each week could be broken down into an entire year of just exploring, okay, how do I actually grow in this? How do I apply this to my life? In week one, we really just talked about uh, the, the world is kind of the, the, the buzz word for the day is mindfulness or being present. And we said, hey, yes, that's a, that's a great thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But how much better to be present with the good shepherd and to learn how to get into his presence. Hey, I wonder if on your journey of faith exploration or perhaps you've already entered into a relationship with God, you would say, I know how to spend time with God. The truth of the matter is I talk to so many people and sometimes people say to me, Van, I'm, I'm embarrassed to even say this because I've been quote unquote a Christian for years, but I don't think I know how to actually spend time with God. And so if you feel that way today, I want you to know you are, you're not alone. And one of the things that we love to do here at Cedar Crest is to help people learn how to for themselves get into the presence of the good shepherd. And so we just wanna encourage you to jump in with us. We're, we're just a big family that's on a journey of, of learning how to walk with God. And so if, if you're not sure what that looks like or, or how to do that, man, just jump in here, give yourself fully to community here. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more uh, later this morning about how to, to specifically do that. But we wanna help you on the journey. For those of you that know how to do it, man, I, I, my prayer is that it is a habit and a rhythm in your life where every single day, you're getting into God's presence. You know, just even for my own life, like I, I do this for a living. Like I get to do this full time. And guess what? I'm constantly trying to re-infuse into my own life new rhythms and fresh ways of getting in God's presence. Because if I just kind of do the same thing over and over again, it, it's like it would be for anyone. It just becomes kind of rote, a little stale, starts feeling a little bit like religion. And I want you to know that kind of a personal rule in my life is if I go two or three days and I don't really sense the presence of God, then something's wrong. And I'll just, I'll stop the presses. I'll just, I, if I need to fast, if I need to cut media out for a day or two, whatever I need to do, God, I have to meet with you. And so I wanna encourage you that if you heard that sermon week one or if you missed it and, and you haven't really found that rhythm of, I gotta get a hold of God today, my invitation to you and the invitation from God to you is to be in the presence of of the good shepherd because that is the foundation that changes everything when it comes to our mental health. Week two, we then learned, okay, once we are getting in the presence of the good shepherd, now we need to begin to do some of the hard work, especially if you deal with anxiety or depression on a regular basis or some other uh, form of, of mental challenge, uh, just with your mental health, then one of the things that we talked about was taking every thought captive. And if you remember it, I talked about the bouncer that stands at the door of our mind. 
And when these random thoughts try to come in, whether it's a, a lie that we kind of believed growing up because somebody spoke something untrue over us, maybe you had a parent or a coach or somebody that said, man, you're worthless. You're not, you're dumb. You're, you're never gonna do anything with your life. And perhaps that lie has been playing in your head. And so every time you bump up against a challenge, you just, something's like, man, I'm just not good enough. I'm never gonna measure up. And the, the enemy of God wants you to play that tape on repeat. But the Holy Spirit actually wants you to take that thought captive and he wants to help you do it by giving you the bouncer of the Holy Spirit at the door of your mind. And so when that thought comes with a fake ID and says, let me in, that bouncer says, no, 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 that's a lie. We're gonna believe the truth today. And we talked about how actually when you go to see a, a professional counselor, many times one of the things they're gonna walk you through is discovering some of the unhealthy thoughts in your life that you're believing and, and begin to replace those things with healthy thoughts. In, in church world, what we say is we're gonna replace the lies with truth. And so doing the, doing the work there. We also did, talked a little bit about medication and we talked about the fact that medication in many instances can be helpful for us. In fact, uh, one individual in our church, uh, she works in the mental health er arena as a counselor and she said, one of the pictures that I like to give those that come and talk to me is when we, uh, when we are in a, in a fight for our mental health, sometimes it's like going into a boxing match with our hands tied behind our back. And sometimes the appropriate amount of medication can actually untie our hands so we actually can put up a fight. But one of the things that we also challenged one another with is, although medication is, is, is helpful and it can help us have a fair fight, we don't wanna just kind of numb the pain with medication. And I gave you a statistic that more than half of the individuals that are on medication for mental health, that's all they're doing. They're not seeing a counselor. They're not uh, working on getting the presence of the good shepherd. They're not doing the other things that we've talked about. And so our encouragement to you is deal with the underlying things going on. Don't just numb it with medication. And this is, it's kind of similar to, you, you may know somebody who's on cholesterol medication. And it, it'd be like, yeah, well, I'm, well, I'm taking my statins. I got my, I got my cholesterol medication, but I'm eating McDonald's every day, right? It's not, <laughs> it's not really gonna help a whole lot. Maybe your numbers are gonna look better at the doctor when he does the blood work, but what's really going on on the inside? Man, it could be all sorts of unhealth. So let's just not numb it. Let's use medication if we're on that to get us to a place where it's a fair fight. And now let me do the difficult work of taking every thought captive, of talking with a professional counselor that can help me even identify some of the lies that I'm believing. And in other words, let me let the Holy Spirit heal me from the inside out so that perhaps I can even get off of medication or perhaps I could reduce my medication or if I'm gonna be on the med medication for the rest of my life, at least I know I'm doing that work on the inside of me and I'm living as healthy as I can live and praise God that the medication gets me to the, to the finish line. And so that was week two. Week three, we then talked about the practicals of what it takes, even outside of just dealing with our, our thoughts and our mental life. We looked at the life of Elijah uh, and some very practical things of just uh, diet, rest, and exercise. And am I putting those things in my life and how important it is just to be holistic in our approach to mental health. And so if you have a struggle in the area of mental health, I would encourage you to do a, just a full analysis of your life. Am I eating right? Am I getting enough rest at night? Am I dealing with the stress that comes into my life with healthy outlets or am I dealing with it with unhealthy outlets? Man, I love some, un, some of the unhealthy outlets. If I'm being honest with you, Bluebell ice cream is one of mine. Two-step, man, that's like woo, the little blue carton. When I walk into a grocery store, it's like, man, I'm over here. Like the blue carton just calls my name. It's like I feel, I feel a tractor beam just kind of going, my, my heart's needs are met in bluebell ice cream. But I've got to remember that it's not just about numbing something. It's like, God, come on, help me on the inside. And so am I being healthy all around? And then last week, we talked about the fact that it can't just be all about us all the time. We are, we are gonna have to take a look inside when we're dealing with mental, mental health struggles but if it stays there, that ends up being a death spiral for us. And we actually will never get fully free from the challenges if all we ever think about is me, myself, and I. So we, we talked about last week learning to serve, getting outside of ourselves and giving ourselves to something greater. And we looked at the scriptures and we said that we, we see that there's really two places that we serve that God has called us to serve. One of those is outside the walls of our church where you volunteer, where you could do anything in the community. And we call that having impact. That's one of our big words here. But we also see in scripture that it's very clear that we are to serve the body of Christ. In fact, 
Every single one of you that calls Jesus Lord has been giving, given a gifting that is unique for the body of Christ. So wherever you're planted in a local church, your goal, if you will, is to say, okay, how is the way that God's created me, how is that to be lived out in the context of serving my other brothers and sisters in this spiritual family that I'm a part of? And we invited you to to be a part of Growth Track here at Cedar Crest. That's the best next step for you to figure out how you're gifted and, and to begin serving other people. And we'll have Growth Track kicking off next week. And today, our fifth and final week, we're gonna put the, the crowning jewel, if you will, on these five weeks of just some very practical things that we can do to move towards mental health. And specifically today, we're gonna be talking about right relationships. How many of you know that the people that you're surrounded by are gonna affect your mental health? Like the, the relationships that you are involved in. And look, some of them you don't get to choose, right? You were born into the family you were born into. And so it's a matter of making sure that we are working on relationships and specifically the ones that we don't get a choice about. Am I doing everything I can to seek health and wholeness in those relationships? Harvard uh, Health, they, had, uh, they have a magazine and publication at Harvard and they talked about the, the vital uh, importance of relationships. This is what they said. They said, having close, positive relationships adds happiness and comfort to our lives and reduces stress. Studies have shown that people who have satisfying relationships with family, friends, and community have fewer health problems, live longer, and experience less depression and cognitive decline later in life. So this is a known fact, this has been studied, this has been the smartest people, at least in our country, have, have done studies on this and they would say your relationships determine so much of your mental health. Now, let me just pause before I go any further. Here's what I wanna say about that. Let's not fall into the trap of just saying, well, I'm gonna cancel anybody that messes with me. <laughs> like I just, if, if you even look at me wrong, spouse included, you're out, gone, not talking to you because I gotta take care of my mental health. No, there is grace from God himself to deal with challenges in our relationships. And how many of you know that there's not a perfect relationship out there? Not a single one, not a marriage, not a parent to a kid, not a parent to... Grandparent, I mean, there's, there's not a perfect relationship. And why is that? Because I'm not perfect and because you're not perfect. And when two imperfect people try to have a relationship with one another, there's gonna be struggle and there's gonna be challenge. And so the key is to not kick everybody to the curb. The key is to say, okay, I've got some brokenness. They've got some brokenness. How do we get healthy and how do we work on this? There will be relationships though where you will just decide and determine hey, I've tried my best with this friend and they just continue to want to pull me into places that are not helpful for me. And you know who those people are. You know who the people are that are uh, baiting you and pulling you towards unhealthy rhythms of life, towards numbing pain with all sorts of painkillers, whether that's a literal painkiller or whether that's a, an inappropriate relationship or whether that's a drink or drug or whatever it might be. You know those folks. And so those individuals you wanna have some boundaries with, but when it comes to family, your, your closest people, the people that love you, man, it's worth the fight. And so this morning, we're gonna talk a little bit about fighting for right relationships. One more study that I wanna share with you before we get into the word of God this morning. Uh, I saw this interesting show on Netflix. You know, I, I throw Netflix under the bus a lot just because it can really clog our brain with a lot of unhealthy thoughts that are not good for us, but there's actually some helpful content out there as well. And so part of being a mature adult is knowing I'm not gonna watch this, and this would actually be good for me. And one of the things that I was watching, I, I can't say the whole thing was necessarily helpful, but I found this really cool experiment uh, that, that's actually not an experiment, it was a study that some social scientists has done about pockets of the world where there are the most centenarians. In other words, people that live to be 100 years old or more. And there are actually pockets in the world where there are entire communities where they just got off the charts comparatively to other communities, numbers of people that have lived well into their 100s, and they call them the blue zones. Now, the reason they call, I first thought blue zones, is that because they sometimes refer to them as blue hairs, but actually, the, the guy that did the study said, no, I just happened to have a blue marker, and I was circling the map with a blue marker. If it had been a pink marker, we would have called it the pink zone, but anyway, it ended up being called the blue zones, and they found these pockets, a couple of them in the Mediterranean region, Greece and Italy, uh, ones in Japan, ones in the western coast of the United States and some other places that they have found these folks. And they, they did a deep dive into their lives to figure out why are they living so long? 
Like what, what is the key to, to living and, and longevity? And man, wouldn't you know it, the things that we pulled out of scripture that have been good for more than 2,000 years, that people have been applying to their lives and experiencing the benefits of following God are still true today. In fact, they're helping people live to be 100 years old or more. And um, many of those things have to do with diet, have to do with exercise and some of the things we've talked about. But one of the key pieces was also healthy and right relationships. And specifically, they broke down in the blue zones three things as it relates to relationships. They said, you need a place to belong, you need loved ones in your life that you put first, and you need the right tribe. A place to belong, a place where you're accepted and and you look to accept others, uh, a place where you are putting your loved ones first, so you're not going outside of your, your key relationships, those people that you're with for life, but you also belong to a tribe. And that tribe is more like a faith community or a local church. Now, this study was a secular study, so they didn't talk about the local church. They just called it a faith community. And listen to what they said. They said, studies have shown that attending a faith-based service four times a month will add up to 14 years of life expectancy to your life. Hey, just coming today, you probably added a couple years to your life. Way to go. All right, you're going, you get, I mean, that's amazing. Just showing up, just being a part of the family of God, something happens on the inside of you. Now, man, I could speak for days about what's going on on the inside of you, but but for those that are like, just just give me the nuts and bolts, just, you know, just cut to the facts. You're going to live longer just being a part of a healthy community, specifically a a faith-based community, and so that's why we talk all the time about whether it's Cedar Crest or whether it's another healthy local church, find one and give yourself to it. Planted in the house of God is how we flourish, is what the psalmist wrote to us. And so today, I wanna encourage you as we think through these relationships that I'm gonna encourage you in, I want you to do an honest evaluation of your own life. Is it possible that church is for you a little bit like a commodity where you show up, You maybe get a little bit of blessing or you hear something helpful and then you move on just like you would show up at a restaurant that you like and you eat a meal and then you move on and maybe you'll go back a month later. Or is it something that you've actually discovered, oh wow, there is is benefit for me and benefit for my family and benefit for my kids and actually benefit for others when we give ourselves to one another. When we actually make it a, a, a decision and a rhythm in our life to say, you know what? I don't know that I necessarily feel like it today, but I know it's good for me, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show up. I'm gonna be present. Look, it, look you could watch online. You could, you could do whatever you want, and, and I, I probably wouldn't know the difference as big as our church is, but it's not what we want from you. It's what we want for you, and what I want for you is health and wholeness and, and life with joy and peace on the inside, and so I just wanna encourage you today. Lean in to relationships. Well, we're going to read a passage in Matthew where Jesus um, had to lean in. This was the, the moment in Jesus' life where he was under the most mental anguish. And if Jesus was ever in a depression, this was the moment. If Jesus was ever dealing with anxiety and anxious thoughts, this was the moment. And I want to see some key pieces about um, how Jesus handled it when his back was against the wall. This is Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, another place we'll be going, by the way, on our trip to the Holy Land. We'll actually go to the actual garden where this happens. And he said to them, speaking to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is is weak. Man, what a moment. If you know the story of Jesus, you know that this is just before he's about to be arrested and eventually tortured and nailed to a cross, not because of anything he did, 
but because he came to pay a price that you and I could not pay. This was the apex of the story. This was where everything was on the line and Jesus being both fully God and fully man has that moment of, God, I don't, I don't know that I can go through with it. Is there any way that this cup can pass? But then we see the man of faith that he was, but not what I will, what you will. So Jesus is in the the biggest troubling moment of his life. He's feeling sorrowful and troubled and overwhelmed even to the point of death. We see as we read in the gospels that he even began to sweat blood. He was under so much uh, strain. We know that this is a physical ailment that can actually happen when someone is under a lot of stress uh, and and distressed mentally. Uh, You can literally burst the little uh, capsularies and blood vessels in your face and literally uh, you can begin to sweat blood. That's how much anguish Jesus was in. And so in this place though, what do we see? What was Jesus doing? You know, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm kind of like the old dog on the farm. You know, when I'm feeling bad, I'm like, I don't wanna be around anybody. Like, I'm, I'm just gonna go off into the woods and be by myself. I, that's kind of how I am. Maybe some of you are a lot more healthy and you're like, no, I, I wanna be around people that love me and, and can take care of me. I, so in the room, there's probably a, a bunch of different personality types and how you deal with struggle, but Jesus modeled for us that when we're sorrowful, when we're troubled, when we're overwhelmed, what did he do? He took his disciples with him. He didn't go off by himself. And there were many, many moments in Jesus' ministry where he would go off by himself to a solitary place to pray. He would leave his disciples behind. But in his biggest moment of need, in his place of struggle, in his desire to figure out if the Father, is there any other way? Do I have to do this? What did he do? He took his disciples with him. Not only did he take his disciples with him, which would have been the circle of 12, that was his life group, but he even took three more with him, Peter, James, and John. That was his, his inner core. So he had his 12, his life group, but he also had what we call around here a discipleship group, a group of two to three. In this case, there was four of them, including Jesus. And he said, you, you guys come on over here. Man, I, I need you to pray with me. I need you to lean in with me. And it says that as Jesus was praying, the guys actually got tired and they began to fall asleep. And so Jesus is like, can you, can you not just stay with me for one hour? And then I love this phrase where he says at the end, he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Man, can I say a yes and amen to that? I would tell you all day long that my spirit longs for great community, that my spirit longs to have friends that are following God and can stay and stand in prayer with me. But so often, the, 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 just the busyness of life and the multiple appointments that I might have in a week and just, you know, I got this counseling thing and that counseling thing and this marriage is in trouble and this, and it's, this is my job. It's not that I'm saying I, I'm annoyed by those things. It's, it's what I'm called to do, but man, you can get kind of tired and eventually you're just like, I don't, I don't have the energy to lean into somebody. And so that's so often I identify with that, man, my spirit's willing, but my flesh just wants to go home and veg out. My flesh is calling out to the bluebell ice cream, not to, not to hanging out with a buddy and, and telling them about my week, Right? especially the men in the room. You know what I'm talking about. We, so we, don't, we don't like really get a high out of sitting down and just sharing my feelings with another guy. That doesn't fully come natural to us. Watch a college football game. Don't talk to me, right? Just let's watch TV. You know, that, that's kind of what I would prefer to do. And it's not that that's a bad thing. That's, that's a part of building community. But Jesus is saying there's a deeper place of leaning in with one another. And so I wonder if in your own life you can say, yeah, I, I know who my 12 are. I know who my three are. I'm, I'm building and, and I'm sowing into relationships so that if it hits the fan in my life, I've got something to lean in, into. Or do we allow the flesh to be weak? Do we allow kind of the, the deceptiveness of a thousand friends on Facebook to make us think we've got community, but when we actually need it, it's not what we need. It's not the depth of relationship that we need. This is one of the biggest challenges of our culture today because we have the impression that we're surrounded by community because of all all the social media that we have. We think, oh, well, I'm relationally full. And you might be full of head knowledge about a bunch of people and be fooling yourselves into thinking you've got a lot of great friends. I can be falling in that same trap as well. But in the end of the day, do we actually have people that will show up in the middle of the night and spend an hour praying with us when we are in distress? when we are sorrowful, when we don't see a way through, when we're not sure our marriage is gonna make it, when our kid gets arrested for dealing drugs, 
what do we do then? Is there somebody there that would stand with us? Are you the type of friend that would stand there with somebody else if they were going through that? Do you have that depth of relationship? Well, here's what we know. The greater the need in our life, the stronger the relationships that will be needed. And the stronger that the relationships will be needed, the more investment of time that is going to be required. So need comes in a moment, but that investment of time has to be built up over time. Investing in relationships is like a retirement account. How many of you have been watching the stock market and been like, oh, there goes my retirement, right? So we watch it go up and down, but here's what we know. Yeah, we, we're in a kind of a challenging moment right now, but generally speaking, the way retirement works is I put a little bit in every single month over a span of a bunch of years, and at the end of that, hopefully, I've got a couple pennies to rub together so that I can actually uh, enjoy maybe a round of golf every now and then once I'm retired, right? This is how retirement works. You don't just show up the last day of work having put zero investment into it and say, whoo, I'm done. Here we go. Moving to, the, moving to Florida. We're off, you know? Here we go. No, it's those small investments over time, and this is how key relationships in our life are as well. It requires dollar cost averaging of relationships. It requires those those regular investments and deposits that are going into our relational bank account. And when I've sewed in relationally into that bank account, when my moment of need comes, there's something to draw on. There's a source of strength. And so I hope that in your own life, you're putting this into practice. We, We see that Peter, Peter was halfway there. You know, he was, he was one of the three that, that was closest to Jesus. And he would go on to do some great things, but we are about to see Peter exposed in this little part of scripture. I'm not gonna read all of it. You will remember it if you uh, remember just Good Friday and all that went down there. And he denies uh, even knowing Jesus. Here's the thing about Peter. Peter was enjoying the, being in the social circle of Jesus, but he hadn't yet fully learned to give himself to that relationship. He wasn't all in. In other words, Peter was just uh, kind of a a good attender (laughs) of hanging out with Jesus. He he would show up, but he hadn't given his heart fully to it. And so it's the same thing for you and for me. You might be able to name me. Oh, yeah, I got got 10, 12 good friends. Yeah, man, you know, we we do dinner every six months. I I don't know. We, you know, we're, we're around each other. But my question is, are you giving yourself fully to it? It requires a bit of vulnerability. It requires actually getting over our flesh when we're tired and when we've been busy and say, I'm just, I'm gonna schedule it. Can I just, I mean, this is very practical, I know, and forgive me for being practical, but I just wanna help. I want to give you something from the word of God that's gonna help you on Monday morning. That's how we'd like to do things here. So here's here's just from my own life. Super busy season, back to school uh, for church and for my own family. Two kids playing football, another kid uh, running cross country. We've got practices every night. We're all over the place. And Kelly, my wife and I, we look at each other and we say, where are we depositing into friendships and into relationships? And so this last week, we didn't even have the time to have dinner together, but we had time to go over to someone's house after dinner. And we said, let's get it on the calendar. We're going to make it happen. It's got to be there because it's that important to us. And so we just say it's, it's non-negotiable. So Wednesday night, we went over to some friend's house after dinner. They were able to put their kids in bed and we were able to have an hour of adult conversation. It wasn't long, but it was intentional and we were giving ourselves to it. And we asked questions about their life, even though we're tired. And they asked questions about our life, even though they're tired. And you know what? God does something in our hearts and he bonds our hearts together. I wonder if you're being intentional about giving yourself to it. Not only are we to give ourselves to those relationships, but something else we learned from the disciples of Jesus is that those friendships were just for a season. You know, I think oftentimes we think, I want lifelong friends. And lifelong friends are amazing. And if you've got lifelong friends, praise God for you. But many of us have moved around or, you know, myself, we lived in Germany for eight years and then uh, back in Texas for six or seven years. And now we're here. And so we, my family has not been able to maintain close lifelong friendships. Now, do I have people that I could go see today in Texas and it would feel like we were just picking up where we left off, uh, you know, five years ago when we moved? Absolutely. Absolutely. But you know, I have to foster friendships where I'm planted. And so it's a, it's a matter of discipline to do that where I am. And so here's what I understand about relationships, and I want you to not miss this. Many times relationships will be seasonal, and we can't grow weary in beginning new relationships. And so one of the things that we often say to our life groups is if you're meeting with God, awesome. And if you're experiencing community with one another, 
That's awesome as well. But there's a third part of life group that we don't want you to miss. And that is those relationships are to be enjoyed so that you can then share that with others who are also looking for relationships. And so what we do around here is we multiply our life groups. We don't want our life groups just to stay together the same group forever because that just becomes a kind of an inward, navel-gazing uh, Christian club. But no, no, we, we want you to understand, even Jesus' disciples didn't spend more than about two years together. And then what happens? They get scattered and they get sent out all over the known world to take what they experienced with Jesus and to share it with somebody else. And so actually true maturity in relationship is first getting connected with God and dealing with my internal stuff and as, as, as best as possible getting health and getting whole in my own heart. Part of that is then leaning into relationships and learning to do that together and having a life group, having some 12 people around me, but maybe even a discipleship group. And so for us, that's men with men and women with women. And oftentimes you can find that in a life group. But those people, that, that ultra close group should be a place where you feel like I can share anything with those guys. I can share anything with those ladies. And, and I'm, I've shared this before, but just another practical. In my own marriage, Kelly and I, we have an agreement these are the safe men that she trusts me to share everything with. And then she's got two or three ladies that she says, Van, do you trust these ladies for, for me to share everything with? How many of you know that people would love to hear some gossip about the pastor, right? So we have to be, we gotta be careful about where we share things. And so do you. You've got things in your life that you don't want every uh, person around the block to know about, but it's right and appropriate to actually trust and to say, Here, here's our crew. And so through the years, that's what we've done. We've just picked two or three. I got some guys, she's got some girls. We talk about who they are, good to go. And, and then we share and we, and we say, here's what's going on in our life. And then we're okay when those relationships change or we move or it's time to invite somebody new into a relationship because that is a part of spiritual maturity. I wonder in your own life if you're thinking through relationships in that way. We see five circles of relationships for Jesus. And so if you're taking notes, this is something you'd wanna write down, the five circles. The first circle for Jesus was the crowds. This was the equivalent of his social media following. These are the people that were kind of coming to where he was and kind of wanting to see what he was up to and, and they would hang out. For you, it might be people at your school, people at university, people in your workplace. Uh, it might be uh, neighbors and people at the HOA or someplace where you volunteer or, or other parents on the sports team that your kid plays on. Those, those are kind of your crowd people. But then Jesus had another circle. Uh, the second circle for him was the 72. So this was not just acquaintances. These were people that, hey, we're, we got similar values and we're going in the same direction. This was the equivalent of his local church. And so as I talk about all the time, give yourself to a local church. You're invited to do that here, but if you don't like me, great, there's another local church somewhere. Go find a place that you enjoy and that you like and that you wanna give yourself to the people there and do it with joy. Be blessed. Be blessed to go and do that. I hope it'll be here, but if it's not here, please don't just kind of be a Christian consumer and come and sit on the back row, but never give yourself to it because again, it's, we don't want something from you. We want something for you. And that's 72 Jesus had, but he didn't stop with just his local church. He, he then called out the 12. Jesus, that third circle of relationships was his life group. And he spent more time with his life group than he did with the entire church. He knew the 72, but the 12, he really invited into his life. But even within the 12, the next level of relationship was Peter, James, and John, his discipleship group. This was the core of the life group. But then there was a fifth and final relationship, and it was Jesus and the Father, one-on-one, -on -one, meeting with his heavenly Father. So in our lives, it should look like the same thing. Me and Jesus, right? Me and my discipleship group, two or three guys that know what's going on in my life, and I'm, I'm sharing openly, and they're sharing openly with me then a life group, kind of that circle of 12, then my local church, and then my community. And if we concentrate on those five key circles of relationships, you can then even begin to say, okay, where am I unhealthy? You might say, man, I'm crushing it in the community. I got a great crowd. I, I, I love the, the parents on the team, on the travel team that we're a part of, and, and we do dinners together, and, and that's going great. But man, I don't think I've got two or three other ladies in my life that really know what's going on that really know the depths of what's happening in my heart or some of the struggles that are going on. So there you go. So then you know immediately, okay, I'm working on my, my two or three circle. My relationship with Jesus, I'm not sure that's strong enough, so I'm, I'm working on that. Just identify the five relationships. Where is the one that where the water level needs to rise? And just begin there. 
And as you begin to invest there, you're gonna find that health comes out. One of the most practical ways to kind of get this started is in terms of finding your 12 or finding your three is just to connect, as I said, to a local church. And the easiest way to do that here at Cedar Crest, jumping into a life group is actually happening this Wednesday. It's called Connect. Right in here in this room on Wednesday night, you can register for it as you go out today or you can go to our website and do the same thing. The reason that we ask you to register is because we're gonna provide childcare for your kids and there's gonna be food here to eat and so your elementary school and younger, please, okay? Middle schoolers, they're old enough. They can figure it out at home. But elementary and younger, we would love to help you. Uh, but please register so we've got enough volunteers here to cover your kids. And we also want to have enough food for you. But we do all of that. People are actually gonna serve back in kids for one reason only. They want you to find healthy relationships. They believe enough in what God's word has to say to us about having 12, about having our, our inner three, that they'll sit back there and hold a baby on a Wednesday night when their week has been busy because they wanna set you free to do it. So don't miss this opportunity to get connected to a group of 12. Now, let me talk again to the men and the women real quick. Ladies, we love y'all. Y'all are so amazing. Uh, the truth of the matter is you can connect pretty easily with someone you don't know that well just, just through talking with them. Men, on the other hand, that's sometimes a little bit more difficult just through talking to connect with someone we've never met. So for men, sometimes it's serving first that helps me get connected to other guys. And so if you're like, dude, a life group, you're killing me, man. I mean, my wife's gonna have me up here on Wednesday night. I would just say, for the sake of peace at home, you might wanna come with your wife on Wednesday night. But actually, we would invite you to, to serve or, or to be in a, in a life group because when you serve, you're actually gonna serve on a team as well. And when you're serving, you get to know some other guys and then you can say, hey, what, what life group are you in? And then if they're actual Cedar Crest people, <laughs> they're, they're gonna say, oh, well, we meet at my house, or we meet over here, why don't you come with me? They're gonna invite you to their life group because again, we believe in maturity. We met with God, we met with one another and now we're making space for somebody else. And so if someone on your serve team says, how do I, how do I get involved in a life group? Their answer should be, come to mine. And then you get connected that way. But whatever it looks like for you, my encouragement for you is to figure out how to get connected. How do we do all this? How do we learn to get in the presence of God in community? How do we learn to take every thought captive in community? How do we learn healthy life rhythms of, of walking the things out like we learned in week three from Elijah in community? How do we learn how to serve one another, how to figure out our giftings, how to get out of ourselves in community? Community is what we were made for. Community is what we need. Community at the end of the day is what will be that fifth and final step on your path to mental health well-being. As we finish our service today, we wanna take a time to pray for everybody in our room. This is a part of the mental health thing, but it's, it's actually even beyond that. We believe here at Cedar Crest that it, the biggest travesty of all would be for somebody to come to our church on a Sunday morning looking for God and only find us. And so I wanna close our service today by uh, offering you an opportunity to come to the front to be prayed for. Jesus would say, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. So in just a moment, the band's gonna come out and lead us in a final song, and the invitation is to come to Jesus. I'm gonna have some friends here at the front, and they're just gonna offer to pray for you. And I want you to know something. We see incredible miracles happen when we pray for people. We've seen wombs open and, and ladies get pregnant that we're told by doctors, you're not gonna be able to get pregnant. We've seen sickness and bodies go. We've seen relationships restored. We've seen marriages healed. We've seen people that are believing for God to break through in their kid's life, breakthrough happen. Over and over again, we see healing physically, emotionally, spiritually. We see God provide. So if you walked in today and deep down in your heart, you said, man, I... I need to encounter God. I've, I've got a place in my life where I'm inviting God to come in. Whatever that thing is, it could be as broad as you might be able to imagine this morning. Please don't leave today without giving God a chance. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. Would you stand with me? And I wanna invite our prayer team as we're standing, begin to make your way to the front. And I wanna invite our elders, if you're in the room, to be down here and if we don't have enough people to pray, life group leaders and discipleship school, you're obviously welcome to be a part of our prayer team as well. 
Here's what I know, in, in, in rows, you can kind of feel like, well, it's kind of crowded and I, I'm not sure I wanna squeeze by somebody or I'm embarrassed, what will people think? Hey, if you're hungry and you need God to move in your life, I'm telling you, if I was in your place, I'd be like, excuse me, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm going down front. I have need of God today. There's nothing to be ashamed of having need of God. Well, let's pray. Let's ask God to come and meet us. We believe God is gonna work in power. Jesus, we love you. And we are so grateful that in moments like this, when we've looked at your word and we've learned how to begin to get into your presence and how to take thoughts captive and how to have a holistic, healthy lifestyle and how to get our eyes off of ourselves and serve others and then to be encouraged to give ourselves to community and to relationship. Lord, that key relationship at the center of it all begins with us and you. It begins when we take the invitation to come to you and get rest for our souls. And so Lord, I just pray as we sing this final song, we're gonna, we're gonna speak Jesus over our family today. And as we speak Jesus over families, and as we speak Jesus over individuals, and as we speak Jesus over prayer needs of financial burden, of need for work, or of, of need for mental health breakthrough, of, of need of reconciliation between married couples, of, of need for, uh, for loved ones that are not even here this morning, but a family member comes forward saying, I, I need prayer for my son, prayer for my daughter, prayer for my, my, my aunt or my uncle, whatever that is, God, we, we know that you long to meet with us. And you long to give us rest for our souls. And so God, as we sing this song over one another, I pray that people would have courage. Those that have need would have courage to come forward because we know there's so much available to us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.